Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 557 of the podcast and it is Friday the 11th of June 2021 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Jessica Bell about her journey as a multi-passionate creative and how she combines all these things, writing song lyrics and fiction and memoir and non-fiction and all these things play a part in her author, author life and she also runs a small press as well. So I hope it's encouraging to those of you who, like Jessica and like me, just can't focus on one thing. And no matter how many times I say, oh, I really just should focus on this or this series or this particular thing. And then I'm like, oh, my brain just popcorns all over the place. <laughs> so yes, uh, that is coming up in the interview section. In publishing news, an interesting story this week in The Guardian here in the UK, as Jeanette Winterson burned some of her own books, saying on Twitter, absolutely hated the cosy little domestic blurbs on my new covers, turned me into women's fiction of the worst kind. Nothing playful or strange or the ahead of the time stuff that's in there, so I set them on fire. Now, there's a few things here. If you if you don't know, Jeanette Winterson is very well known here in the UK. In fact, her book, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, is studied in school. I studied it at A-level. I mean, maybe it's not anymore, but it certainly was when I went to school. And she's a, a very respected feminist author, award-winning, 30 years of publishing and writing. And, uh, you know, she's just, she's a very famous literary figure here. So this was, this is a big deal. And she's a, well, I would, have thought a very powerful author in that she sells books and she's you know very well awarded and yet she clearly had no control or say over those reprints and what they said on the back now so that presumably means she either didn't have a chance to approve them or that they did put them in front of her and then ignored her comment I mean we don't know the details but I was just reading it going it's, it just seems crazy to me that an author of the stature of Jeanette Winterson would not be be happy with her books. You'd think the publisher would want her to be happy. So she clearly has no control. And it made me wonder what hope new authors would have if authors like Jeanette don't have a say. And also it demonstrates disdain for women's fiction, which I also thought was crazy from the perspective of a lot of people who read Jeanette also read women's fiction. In fact, you know, there's, what's wrong? There's nothing wrong with women's fiction. So I thought that was strange. Um, as a publicity stunt, it's there certainly caused some backlash and some comment. And I don't know whether it will sell books, but I thought it was just fascinating how, in terms of the, the power play going on there. So I thought I'd share that. In my personal update, I have the first 8,000 words on what was Day of the Martyr and is now definitely called something else. <laughs> I'm just sorting out a new cover, which will teach me to get ahead of my own discovery writing process. Just don't do that. Do not decide on a title until I have at least an idea of what might go on in the book. <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. I also did finally make it to London on last week uh, to the British Museum for the first time in 18 months. And it was very exciting in many ways, as in getting away and getting to London and sad in others, as the museum was, was pretty empty and London actually was quite empty. I think everyone's uh, in hol on holiday around the English coast at the moment. The Thomas Beckett exhibition was interesting, and uh, if you don't know of Thomas Beckett, he was an arch the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, murdered in the cathedral by uh, Henry the Second, King Henry the Second's uh, knights, in oh, eleven seventy. <laughs> I want to say 1170. So me medieval murder, like uh, almost a thousand years ago. Um, and it was his um, 
850 years last year and there was going to be all these celebrations but because of covid that was uh, put off but i did my um canterbury pilgrimage as part of that and even though i'm not a catholic i'm not religious i love all the iconic stuff around religious relics and church history and stuff like that so i went to the beckett exhibition to get ideas for this book and as happened with my as has happened so many times it's just i find it just incredible this kind of synchronicity that happens so you start thinking of a story and you think oh wouldn't it be cool if that was true and then you find evidence that it was <laughs> or something that helps. So basically, I was walking into the British Museum saying to myself, I would really love to set some of the book at Cologne Cathedral, where I haven't been. So I want to be able to go there (laughs) when we're allowed to travel. We're not allowed to travel still. Um, Germany is not open and you can't go there anyway from the UK. Uh, But I do want to set some of the book there. So I thought, well, Cologne has the bones of the Magi, supposedly, as a relic. And that has obviously nothing to do with Beckett's murder at Canterbury. But I went in thinking, I would love to find a way of linking the Magi to Beckett. And sure enough, it was absolutely crazy. In the exhibition was a golden reliquary with the Magi on the top and the murder of Beckett on the bottom, which was very cool. That goes straight in the book and uh, enables me to link it with a real life object. So there's a picture on Instagram and on Facebook at JF Penn Author, linked in the show notes if you're interested in having a look at the, the picture. But um, I wanted to share it because if you write the types of books like I do, as in you use as much of real places, real history, real uh, religion as much as possible, and then you just want to take it just a bit further, that's basically what I do with my fiction, then this is a very happy thing. (laughs) And it has happened every single time I've written a book. So yeah, I thought I'd share that. It's very exciting. So I have also been writing in my a new co-working place and uh, it's quite, it's good. I feel like it's a good thing for me to put a line in the sand between my fiction writing self and my podcasting self, my business self. It's definitely helped because the pandemic, obviously everything has just blurred into one space. And so, yeah, I feel more positive about that and it's about half an hour walk each way so it gives me more uh, time outside as well. I also wanted to mention that I'm listening to the audiobook of Hollywood versus the author edited by Stephen Schwartz and uh, featuring loads of authors. What's nice about the audio is uh, it's narrated by many of the authors in the book. Now I've, I've had the print book for a couple of years now and dipped in and out of it but the audiobook is is really good. If you have any interest in seeing your books on film or TV then definitely get this book Hollywood versus the author. It covers every angle from incredible incredible success to terrible contracts to years of disappointment in development hell to buying back rights and intellectual property theft. So it is well worth getting um, to kind of educate yourself around film and TV. And in useful stuff, Mark Dawson's Ads for Authors course is open at the moment, but only for a limited time. So if you want to get your Amazon and Facebook ads sorted for your books, and they cover lots of different uh, bookbub ads as well as covered in there and and, uh, really comprehensive course on advertising for authors, then check it out. You can use my link and support the show, thecreativepen.com forward slash ads, ADS, thecreativepen.com forward slash ads. It is a really good course. I've been through it and I'll probably go through it again. I've been through it several several of the modules several times and I'm going to probably do it again. Um, I keep trying um Amazon ads for my fiction and it just hasn't worked but I have an idea (laughs) that I'm gonna maybe go back to trying again but for Facebook I've been using Mark's training for years very very good Uh, as ever I would say you do need to have the basics sorted before ads are worth the investment it is not a magic bullet so don't go oh if I do this course and I put ads on then I'll sell millions and millions of books Uh, not true (laughs) 
(laughs) But it can help you sell more books if you have a few in a series and you're in a genre that works for ads and all those types of things. But as I said, it covers BookBub. I find BookBub ads for my fiction work really well and I find Amazon ads for nonfiction work really well. And Facebook does pretty okay for either of them, um, but I run those in campaigns. So yeah, anyway, I'm not talking about my own ads, but definitely check them out, thecreativepen.com forward slash ads. And as I said, it's only open for a few weeks. So if you're listening to this and it's not June 2021, then you can go and get on the wait list for next time. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Julie says, I love how Guy has created a business and a life around what he loves the most. Super inspiring. And SJ Pajonas says, yay for another hack. Love the QR code idea. I'm going to implement that for all my books. By the way, there's a QR code generator built into Chrome. Okay, that's very cool. And also Jeremy Bassetti says, um, the Apple Shortcuts app has a built-in QR code generator, fast, free, no frills. So yes, um, we talked about creating QR codes to put in your books. And I I definitely feel like QR codes have become a thing in the pandemic. Like this, my dad, for example hasn't has a phone but he wouldn't have known uh, a smartphone <laughs> he wouldn't have known how to use a QR code before but now it's we have to here in the UK check in to um, venues with the track and trace app using QR codes and so they've become something you see and some restaurants are using them on menus so there's no touch all that kind of thing and so yeah it's it's become part of, of our daily life I think here in, in the UK certainly not sure about other places but I feel like QR codes are becoming far more mainstream now they've been mainstream in Asia for a long time but we're now starting to see them everywhere so I I I didn't feel confident before that using QR codes in a book would be something that people would want and now I feel like yeah it's probably a good time so it's definitely something I'll be thinking about uh yeah Sharish actually says I've been using QR codes in my books Uh, I write art instruction books, which a lot of people prefer to buy in print. Typing out complex URLs is simply boring. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so that's good. And thanks to Caitlin Ryan, who sent a picture of walking her dog. My wife needed our shared office for a meeting. But the great thing about being your own boss, you can finish early. Spending some time taking this gorgeous girl, her dog, for a walk while catching up on the podcast. So yes, thank you for the picture, Caitlin. And as ever, I love to see pictures of where you are in the world. Often where we live is not exciting to us, but it's very exciting to other people. So you can uh, tweet me at The Creative Pen. You can email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. And of course, you can leave a comment on the show if you um, want to. You can always find the show at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast and just go to the right episode. And talking of print books, today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark. And I use Ingram Spark to print and distribute my print books wide. Because with Ingram Spark, it's my content, but they help me do more with it. So why even consider Ingram Spark? Because you could use KDP Print. Well, you can use both together. And the most important thing here is that if you only use KDP Print, your books are not available (laughs) in bookstores, libraries, universities, and print-on-demand sites in many other countries. So why is this important? Well, if you think about the model of a bookstore, the bookstore makes money from buying your book at a discount and then selling it to a customer, and the profit is what they keep. Now, for many ethical reasons, for book bookstores do not want to buy print books from Amazon anyway. So if your print book is only available on Amazon, they're not going to buy it. If your book is available through Ingram Spark, it will be in the catalogue that the bookstores buy from and the libraries and all of this type of thing. And it will include the discount that you can add on Ingram Spark. So that is pretty exciting. If you want your books in bookstores and libraries and all of that, then you need to be wide and and go through Ingram Spark if you care about getting your books in these places, obviously. And remember, even if you're in KU for ebooks and you're exclusive with your audio, you can still go wide with your print books. And I think this is really important and authors often get confused. The Amazon exclusivity for KU is only for ebooks, so you can still go wide with your print. 
you will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools, universities, chain bookstores and more across, across a global network of distributors, including bookstores like Foils, Blackwells and Waterstones here in the UK. And in fact, I have found my own books in Blackwells uh, and uh, yeah, in Blackwells mainly um, several times in the last few years since I've been with Ingram Spark, as well as bookshop.org, which has become very popular in the pandemic. Booktopia in Australia and New Zealand, Chapters Indigo in Canada, Walmart, Target and lots of independent stores in the US. Of course, it also means your book will be available to order, but you still have to drive demand. But to be honest, I haven't done much except just make them available and continue with my own marketing. So, for example, I will say to my readers, and I'll say to you again right now, you can get my books in your libraries in any format, just get the librarian to order them in or you can order my books at your local independent bookstore and support the independent bookstore just go in and uh, they will be able to find the book on their system and as I said I've stumbled upon physical books in like Blackwells in Edinburgh I've had books for sale at book fairs and conventions because the bookstore that runs the convention will usually order in So yeah, it's very exciting. You can choose to use returns, but it's not necessary. You can choose your discount percentage. You can also bulk order. For example, if you're a speaker, you want back of the room copies for live events, or if you work direct with schools or bookstores, you can ship them directly. So for example, uh, I get orders through curluppress.com and I just ship directly to bookstores in the US from the US plant of Ingram. Um, So yeah, It all works very, very well. So what are you waiting for? If you want to go wide with your print books, it's your content. Do more with it. Head over to ingramspark.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons and especially the limited series of futurist interviews, which uh, hopefully you enjoyed the NFT show last week. And I've got one coming up on uh, pseudo write and AI writing in the next couple of weeks. Thanks to new patrons. Jose A. Santana Jr., Meggie Davis and Natalie Zett. And thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. Those of you who've been supporting for months and years, you're all amazing and you enable me to continue doing those special shows. Plus, you get the extra Q&A audio, which I will probably be recording this week. You can ask your questions and there's an extra sort of 40, 45 minute audio with me chatting away, answering those. And you get access to the entire backlist if you become a patron for just a couple of dollars or euros or pounds or Canadian dollars a month less than a coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous you can support the show at patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen right let's get into the interview Jessica Bell is an award-winning author and poet, singer-songwriter, graphic designer, small press publisher and voiceover actor. Her books include memoir, literary fiction and the Writing in a Nutshell non-fiction series for writers. Welcome to the show, Jessica. Thank you very much, Joanna. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you because, of course, we know each other in person, but we haven't caught up for years. So, <laughs> oh, And we met, what, 10 years ago or something? <laughs> I know like it it does feel like a long time uh I usually say to people oh tell us a bit about how you got into writing but you are a multipreneur so I wanted to ask how have the various aspects of your creativity emerged over your career so far because obviously you've got all these different strands yeah it really all began when I was a kid because I'm a child of parents who were songwriters and musicians and also artists in other ways, such as painting and drawing. And I was pretty much singing before I could speak. So around the age of 11, I would say, I turned to poetry writing and then songwriting and I got piano lessons and learned guitar myself by just watching my parents play. And when I reached high school, I became extremely passionate about creative writing as well. And already by that age of 16 I was writing short stories and at least one new song a week. During my last year of school I had a strange obsession with graphic design (laughs) but as I was terrible at maths I failed my graphic design class and didn't pursue it because the school put a huge emphasis 
on graphic design leading into a career as an architect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to be creative and I was told to sign up for an art class. <laughs> so all the meanwhile, my music was going strong, but my grades weren't perfect. I was getting all A's and B's in, in English and creative subjects and mostly D's and fails in maths and science, etc. So even th- those D's in subjects that I had wanted nothing to do with meant that I couldn't even get into my first choice of university course of professional writing. Uh, and I had to settle for an arts course at La Trobe. At university, I majored in English and focused all my energy on my band. We were called Spank and we won some major competitions, got radio, airplay, TV appearances. But then, unfortunately, I fell in love with a boy in Greece <laughs> and moved here. From and Australia, I, right? Just so people yeah. know, you, you were in Australia and then you moved to Greece. Yes, and I pretty much left everything I had achieved music-wise behind by the time I turned 22. And the responsibility of being an adult in a foreign country wasn't so easy. Uh, So many of my first years were spent earning a living working in bars and restaurants. By the time I'd turned 25, I'd finally landed in a job at a publishing company as an editor for English language teaching books. There I learned pretty much learned the ins and outs of editing and publishing, and I eventually got into writing ELT textbooks as well. So I stayed in that career for 11 years straight, and uh, except in the middle of that, I had an urge to write a novel. I was around 29, 30, so I did, and I snuck writing time in before and after my day job. That novel was called String Bridge. Uh, and was published in 2011 by a small press. Unfortunately, six months after its release, they liquidated. So all my work was going down the toilet and I chose to self-publish it. I wasn't letting this go to waste. Basically, it was a blessing in disguise because this was the beginning of me becoming my own boss. By that time, I had the publishing and editing know-how, so I thought, why not try my hand at designing my own book covers? Uh, Turns out that teacher in high school who told me to do art didn't know what they were talking about because (laughs) now being a self-taught freelance graphic designer is how I learn it if you're living. Designing book covers is basically my main income, but I'm still writing books and playing music as well. So far, I've published four novels. Uh, I've got a fifth one coming out this September, three poetry books, four writing and publishing reference books. And in 2016, I joined a band called Keep Shelley in Athens. And I also have my own side music projects, one called Bruno and the other Mongoa. And last but not least, I'm the publisher of Vine Leaves Press, which has been going strong since 2014. Uh, and that's my career in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I I love it because I think so often people think, oh, well, you need an MFA in writing to become a novelist and you need a degree in publishing to become a publisher. And like you said, you were you were failed in inverted commas mathematician who became a graphic artist. And it's 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 so interesting because I feel like there's an obsession with degrees and all the things that people tell us you should be educated in. But it sounds like everything you've done is is self-taught. Well, basically, well, from the beginning, I was taught you need a degree as a backup plan. Like my parents totally supported my my desire to become a rock star, but they said you need to do something else to earn some money because we know firsthand that you're not going to earn that much money from being a musician. So I did get that, have that backup plan. I got my degree, but in the end, what I'm earning money from, what I'm making a living from, has absolutely nothing to do with that degree. (laughs) (laughs) Me too, because my degree's in theology, so... Yeah. But no, I think I think that's really good um, for people to hear. But th- I, I also wanted to talk to you because I, I mean, there is this school of thought and perhaps it is true that it's easier to be successful if you only focus on one thing. And I often use the example of Lee Child and the Jack Reacher novels and, you know, just write the same book over and over again and people will love it. Or as a singer songwriter, write the same type of thing over and over again. And what do you think about that? And is it even possible for people like yourself? And I include myself, although I'm nowhere near as multi-passionate as you are. (laughs) 
there is no way I could just do one thing, though I have fantasized about it many times. When I joined uh, Keep Shelley in Athens, I let my other projects and passions dwindle a little bit to focus on singing for them. But I really very soon realized that I could not stop my brain from creating new business ideas. <laughs> so instead of veering away from all the things I'd spent years to establish, I just launched back into doing everything at once again. And I'm so much happier that way. <laughs> I'm just not the type of person to be doing one thing. Right. And I, I'm totally with you. Like I've said over and over again, right, I need to do, I just need to focus on writing fiction or I just need to focus on, or even one type of fiction. You know, if I could only just write action adventure thrillers. I could be Clive Cussler. And then it's like, no, that's just not going to happen. So there's obviously a negative side of it, yeah. which is, yeah, sure. If we just did one thing, maybe we'd be more successful there, but we'd be miserable. Mm-hmm. But on the positive side, how do you think your various aspects of creativity feed each other well of course I use a lot of my uh, creative energy from writing music in my fiction writing I think that's because music is so emotional as well and quite uh, it brings up memories and makes you feel nostalgic or happy or sad so it really sparks my writing ideas and also because I'm a graphic designer as well, I'm able to design my own book covers before my book's even finished and that even helps me finish writing my book because, one, I get motivated and, two, I get other I- other story ideas. But I think that's really interesting because I think, des- obviously, I'm not a designer, but I get a lot of ideas from visual things, things that I see in, say, museums or in picture books or on the internet, like visual things stimulate ideas for me so is is that what you mean with the cover design it stimulates other ideas yeah well obviously because I'm working with stock imagery I cannot create I'm not an illustrator I I use already existing imagery to create my book covers so I'm forced to search for imagery that not only portrays some thematic element of a story but uh, evokes some kind of emotion so it's not all about telling the story in the cover it's about attracting a reader to it and making them feel something so obviously I can't find images that are going to represent my story a hundred percent so there are always very variables in the imagery that spark ideas for me in the storyline and then I guess the other question I had is, how do you know when an idea, so you get a spark of an idea, how do you know if it's a song, if it's a poem or a novel or something else? I don't. It's just um, if I sit, I usually have a schedule of, for myself for either work or creativity, books, music, whatever, but it's very hard for me to uh, follow that schedule 100 percent I mean the only schedule I follow 100 percent is for anything that someone else is relying on if it's for myself I or it keeps getting pushed down the list so basically whatever I'm inspired to do in any free moment be, be it writing or songwriting or design I just go with the flow it's not I can't really explain how one feeds into the other exactly it's just it's, you know how inspiration hits you and you don't really know where it's come from so you almost say okay my muse wants to write a song and then the ideas come for a song as opposed to you get an idea and then you decide where the idea fits yeah exactly yeah oh, I, I find it so interesting I mean I very 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 occasionally I'll have an idea and know that it's a short story but I've not written very many short stories but sometimes that idea is small enough that it feels like a short story whereas most of what I get ideas about I slot into a novel in some way I guess. Right well I think everyone even when you're not writing what you know everyone does write what they know in some form or another because I think everyone's feeling the same feelings and experiencing the same things in, with a different perspective. You've mentioned emotion there and I've read uh, your memoir and you've opened up emotionally and written about your family and your life and of course your songs are quite obviously emotional and many people want to write memoir like including myself but it's very hard to be open so how have you managed that with yourself like with 
I guess, the strength to do that and also with your family who you write about. Yeah. In the beginning, I was extremely scared about publishing my memoir. Uh, But something inside me was really pushing me to write this thing and I just couldn't avoid it for my own sanity. As There's quite a lot of sensitive information in there about my mother. It was totally possible for her to ask me not to publish it. So I pretty much just wrote the book for myself to get everything off my chest. And I said to myself, if I can't publish it, it's okay. Its job has been done. My story's been told. It doesn't have to be read. So when I completed it, I sent it to my mother and I said to her, if you're uncomfortable with this in any way, I won't publish it. But she, <laughs> the very next morning, she told me she'd stayed up all night reading it uh, and told me I'd be stupid not to publish it. So, of course, I was overjoyed, but then my own doubts set in and the things I'd revealed about myself and I thought, do I want to publish this? Uh, I pretty much had to disconnect myself from the content for a while before releasing it, but eventually I'm glad I did because apparently from reviews I've read that the stories resonated with a lot of readers. Uh, It's nerve-wracking, but it can uh, have positive effect. Yeah, I think that's so true. But I I mean, I definitely have fear of judgment around what will people think of me? Is is that what you felt too? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I was reckless when I was younger and I was also not very kind. So uh, it's, it's, I was definitely about judgment. And I guess I didn't want my current reputation to be tarnished in any way but it didn't turn out like that I mean it seems that people have realized that the hardship I experienced made me be who I am so that's reassuring yeah, that's true. But do you worry? I mean, this is okay. This is what I worry about. I'm asking you as someone who's done it. Do you worry that you are somehow trapped as a person in that book? And obviously, your life has moved on from who you were in the book, but you don't have a memoir about the the new stuff. So, do you, is there any way that your past self is sort of preserved in amber in a way? It was until I decided to write a sequel. And I also rebranded the first, like the first original one was called Dear Reflection, and Never Meant to Be a Rebel. But I recently rebranded it, made a new cover and entitled it Go. What's the subtitle? I can't even remember my own subtitle. <laughs> about, about, about finding binge drinking and finding happiness. Oh, tackling binge drinking and finding happiness, something like that. Anyway, and so I decided to write a sequel called Stay which will be uh, my life from the ending of the first memoir. Because basically the main theme of the first memoir was about how I ran from my emotions and I would therefore run from everything in my life. But in the end, I decided to stay. So the second one will be about my life deciding to stay and how much more wonderful it is that way, tackling your head on. Oh, that's great. And but that's interesting because of course you didn't have that second book when you wrote the first one. And but it's interesting with memoir, isn't it? Because in my mind, in a way, I mean they they can be thematic, they can be more life based, like like yours is. And mm. many memoir writers say that you get a kind of addicted to writing memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you've got a long way to go, so life's not over yet. (laughs) No, (laughs) that's true. That's for sure. But no, I think that's a really good tip for people. And then I guess a lot of the sharing, honestly, I mean, one, not everyone's going to read the book. Do you share as openly on things like social media in a way that's the the same or different, or do you protect yourself in in that way? I used to share very much in the same way and would and but eventually stopped sharing so much because I wanted to be more positive mainly for my own outlook on life I didn't want to be complaining and airing my dirty laundry on social media when I didn't air my dirty laundry in real life so what why should I do it to people I don't know no 
and being more positive online and and editing myself actually makes me a happier person because I don't dig my own dig holes and then also reading horrible comments from people who are degrading your feelings when they know nothing about you I mean why should I deal with that Mm. No, I think that's very sensible. And yeah, I mean, I'm usually really careful about what I do on social media. And it's definitely become a difficult place. Uh, And it but everyone has to decide where they want to share. But it's funny, isn't it? Because in a book, even though it feels like this is the most open you can be, actually, the people who end up reading your book do or all the way through end up caring about you more than someone who just sees some tweet and and says yeah. something negative. It's so true, isn't it? I mean, people have knee-jerk reactions on social media, whereas if it's in a book, it's so much such a different kind of experience. Yeah. And it, it makes you wonder too, I mean, would someone's, someone's derogatory comment, would they say that if, that if you they were saying it to you face-to-face? I mean, it's so much easier to say things, horrible things online, I find. Yeah, exactly. And then I guess coming back to the word kind that you mentioned, I almost feel like with it, with reading a memoir where someone has been hurting, you feel like you want to be kind to them because they, they struggled. So almost sharing the difficult things is what makes, what draws people to you more. Mm, I think so. I mean, I remember reading a review that said, it's really difficult rating and reviewing a memoir because this is someone's life. So I'm just going to tell you what I thought of the story, (laughs) which is really logical. It would be nice if everyone did that. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) Okay, so changing tack a bit, you span the world of books and music. And even though, I mean, I feel like there are so many similarities and so many differences, but what do you think authors can learn from musicians? Well, Creatively, I'm going to go back to the emotion thing because uh, music makes a person feel things, be it happy, nostalgic, melancholic, thrilled, you name it. And I think books should have a similar impact on a reader. Every book, you need to make your readers feel something. That's how, it's how they will remember you in your book because I think emotions have a very strong impact on memory. Uh, so that's the, my creative lesson. <laughs> And my business lesson is I'm not entirely sure that there are similarities anymore. I think there used to be because now I find that when you publicise your music on social media, it it is so ignored unless it's YouTube. Like I, I find that advertising on Facebook, for example, a book versus a song the book will do so much better than the music. I just think people don't want to spend the time sitting, listening on the computer, on social media. They want to download it and leave it for later, for example. That's what I've found anyway. I wonder also with the sort of productivity angle, because it feels like to be a successful a songwriter and a musician you have to be really productive like you m- most people are not going to just write one song and expect that to do really well like it feels like you have to be a lot more prolific as a songwriter or a, or a band that's true I think that's why many artists are releasing singles regularly now on Spotify I mean they'll bring out a new single every month rather than an album every year so it's keeping them and their brand visible and their music uh, available to stream something new constantly. I think we're all craving something new consistently nowadays. It makes it a little harder with books because you can't write a whole book. I think that's where the Kindle singles came from, from people's need for new material and getting through it fast. Yeah, it's interesting. Although, of course, um, uh, a song might only take three to five minutes to listen to generally whereas uh, I mean still even that the quickest readers can't read a book that fast <laughs> I think it's about two hours you could probably get your quickest book 
<laughs> yeah, it is. It's really interesting. And what about collaboration? Because of course, I've, I often, I'm very, I know, I feel like a bit of a lone wolf and I, I generally work alone. I like doing everything yeah. myself and I'm not very good at collaborating. But I feel like musicians have to collaborate. Like most musicians are collaborating in order to be successful. Is, is that something you've seen? Yeah. Uh, in my experience, the collaboration is still very individual and isolated though because for example in in keep charlie in athens the founder of that band is the one who produces the music and i write the lyrics and he does the melodies himself as well so he sent he basically sends me a guide track with his thought of a melody and i write lyrics to that so we each have our roles as well we don't sit down like some people think trying to write a song music together for example that's not how we work I'm sure that other people do it differently but I think it also works well with my personality and the founder of Kip Shelley's personality as well would very much like to work alone so I think that just works better that way probably works better in a pandemic as well yes <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I think that's really interesting because we all have so many images in our heads from movies generally of people yeah. in some recording studio, you know, playing yeah. the piano I'm together. Well. Top hit in five minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So then um, I wanted to also ask about Vine Leaves Press, because being an individual indie author is hard enough. So why did you start Vine Leaves Press and what types of books do you publish and, and what's your vision for that? Okay, Vine Leaves Press is actually a natural progression of Vine Leaves Literary, Literary Journal, which I started in 2010. Um, the journal eventually ran an award called Vine Leaves Vignette, Vignette Collection Award. Is, that's what we specialised in. And one of the prizes was having that collection published. So that started us off publishing books. And I soon realised I wanted to publish more than just vignette collections. So the journal was renamed and rebranded as Vine Leaves Press in around 2014. The books that we publish now uh, straddle the line between experimental and mainstream, the motive being to show readers of mainstream that they can also enjoy something a little more experimental and readers of experimental works that they can also enjoy something a little more mainstream. Well, I guess, why did you want to go from just publishing your books to publishing other people's books? Because there's a lot of work involved in working with authors. I, you know, I love all you authors out there, but authors are hard to work with. <laughs> They are very hard to work with and you need to be very patient. And I think being an author myself has helped with that because I know how sensitive I can be about my writing if someone wants to tear it apart. I just think like but because, it, I mean, I work with, I have a partner now, Amy McCracken, and she's also an author. So we work together on that and where we also only publish authors that we think would be a really great addition to our team because we've sort of become a a family as well so yeah we choose we're very picky (laughs) and we only publish around 10 titles a year as well so that's caused to also be picky Mm. so what well so what are you picky about if people are interested who are your ideal uh clients what are your ideal types of authors or books our ideal types of author is someone who uh is willing to work as a team otherwise for example I get some queries that will say I already have a cover designed by my brother and when you publish me we must use it and I'm like uh no we mustn't and by simply saying that I will pretty much reject them regardless of whether the book's any good because I don't want people like that in Vineley's Press because we are a team and teamwork does not jive with the one-man band attitude. Uh, There's always self-publishing for that. (laughs) What type of, I mean, literary is such a broad church, you know, what types of books, you mentioned experimental, but what types of books would you be looking for? What should people pick? We publish poetry collections, uh, short story collections, flash fiction collections. We'll publish a lot of memoir we have coming of age novels, historical novels, contemporary novels, a few anthologies, um, also writing reference books. Um, 
pretty much all very character driven, I would say. And uh, I think you you had an interesting example on the website about one of your bestsellers. It was something about a graveyard or something like that. Oh, the Walmart Book of the Dead. Yes, the Walmart Book of the Dead, which is is fantastic. And it did actually make me go, oh, I'm going to buy that. (laughs) It's very original, readable, you know. It it doesn't have to be so experimental that only diehard poets will understand and be unique, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So with Vine Leaves Press, what have been your challenges in in running that business on top of everything else? Pretty much the financial aspect of running it. Um, In the beginning, well, we still are very volunteer-based or token payment-based or we offer a certain percentage of royalties. If someone's edited a book, they'll get a percentage of royalties of sale of that book because we just don't have the means to pay outright at the moment. Uh, we're hoping we will soon. We've been going since 2014 uh, and really only the past year and a half we've started making a profit, so it's been a hard slog. But we did manage to break even every year, which was reassuring. I think in the beginning we were publishing... I mean, this is going to sound a little shallow, but uh, you have to think now that it's a business. We were, we were publishing authors that had absolutely no social media presence and brilliant books, and they, they really just wanted to be the mysterious writer sitting at home and not connecting with anybody in the world. Uh, and that doesn't work anymore. So eventually we had to, Amy and I had to sit down and say, look, this is a business. I know we love these brilliant experimental literary genius books but if they don't have any social media presence we just cannot do it anymore so we decided to actually make that one of the stipulations if they did not pitch us not only their book but also their social media site where, how, where they're active in social media then uh it's a no-go it means everyone needs to needs to pitch in with their marketing and since we have done that, it's been so much better. I mean, it's not as if we don't do anything. I mean, we, we offer our equal share in marketing, but we want our authors to match that as well. Yeah, and I think, that, I mean, this is very common now in the publishing world. This is not unique to you guys at all. Even in the big publishers, they want to know about the author platform. Although I would question there why it's just social media. I mean, for me, for example, obviously I have two podcasts and uh, I have an email list that are far more significant than my social well, media. Yeah, I, I meant platform, not just social media. Right. So if people have a blog, for example, and subscribers yeah. to a blog, that's completely fine. Yeah. And if they're doing uh, uh, conferences or a host on a radio show or something, it's, that's equal in equal measure as well. So it is, what is your author platform is, is really yeah. the question. And so what, what do you say to authors who really just aren't interested? I mean, obviously you say no, but in order to encourage people listening, what do you find are the best ways to sell those kind of books? What are you finding are the most successful platforms or the ways to sell literary fiction? You need to find uh, authors who are really passionate about their book, their book and they, they simply... If you've got someone who just wants to publish their book, to see it in print, to hold it in their hands, it's not the right kind of author. I want someone who's going to actively promote their book and believe in it. Uh, We want to believe in that book too. So if we believe in the book and you've got the platform, then there's high chances that we're going to publish it. And it's not – sometimes we look at trends, but it's not – a a deciding factor of what we publish because as seen with the warm-up book of the dead there was no trend to be seen with that kind of book and it did so so well Mm. it's got quite a it's a quirky title it's an unusual title that makes you stop and think about it yeah they need to have some element of um surprise or some unique angle and i'm not I know nothing can really be unique these days, but to some certain extent, yes. And then obviously, as you say, this has been a really challenging business. 
what do you see as your future? Because you've done so many things and you do so many things. Do you see yourself in 10 years time as still doing everything? Or I mean, now you've got a, a baby son and you've got other things going on yeah. in your life. Do you see yourself honing things down in the future? I would hope to. And that goes back to one of the questions in the beginning, doesn't it? Of trying to go down to focus on one thing. But I would love, I would absolutely love to build Vine Lake Press to a point where that could be mine and Amy's main income. So I could just do covers on the side and write and play music. I mean, Vine Lake Press has been a passion of mine from the beginning. And when a couple of years ago when uh, there was a kind of a threat that we might have to close it for financial reasons that just devastated me and I just knew I had to do something about it. Well, that's really interesting. I do feel that a lot of you know authors are now becoming small press publishers and that's obviously how a lot of the big publishing houses came about is you know there was yeah. an originally someone who then did it and that's developed over time so it's a good it's a good tradition but it's interesting that you that is where you see yourself is running that business and right and your own creativity comes second not really because I publish my own books through there and I design all the covers so I'm very involved I'm not just a publisher and I'm also communicating with all the authors on a regular basis because we have a Facebook group where all the authors and staff are members and everyone supports each other in there and chats in there and so we've become a real nice little community of authors and artists in there which is uh really encouraging as well for new authors that we bring on to know that they've got this support network already established for them. I mean, everyone reviews each other's books and shares each other's books. Yeah, I was going to ask about that, about sort of economies of scale. And, you know, presumably you also have a Vine Leaves Press email list. I mean, are you finding it's getting easier to do promotions the bigger you yeah. get? It is. It is much easier. And uh, lately we actually started... It was last November, actually, we started a little flash fiction ser- series in the newsletter called 50 Give or Take. It's basically just 50-word stories that are delivered to your inbox daily. And it's becoming really popular. I mean, the sign-ups are soaring on there. And it, as well as signing up for that series, they're signing up to our news and, announcement, news and announcements uh, newsletter as well. So we're gaining an audience for our general book sales, book sale campaigns, as well as the flash fiction uh, newsletter. Mm. Oh, no, that's really good. I think that is basically offering free content and yeah. getting email signups, yeah. right? And it's exclusive. It's in, in the inbox only. I mean, we don't share them on social media, so they need to sign up in order to get them. And I get emails all the time saying how much they enjoy it. and It's really nice. Hmm. Well, that's a kind of experimental and quite a different thing, which suits the press anyway. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, so where can people find that and you and your books and vine leaves and everything you do online? Well, I've got a portfolio site that's iamjessicabell.com. On that site, there are summaries and links to all the different me's, so you can access everything there. And uh, just say that flash fiction thing again as well. It's called... 50 give or take. If they just go to vinelyspress.com, they'll find the link there to sign up. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Jessica. That was great. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great fun. So I hope you found the interview with Jessica interesting today and also comforting for those of you who are just as multi-passionate. As I've said, some days life would be easier if I could just focus on one thing. (laughs) But that is just not right for so many of us. We need to do all the things. So let's embrace the multi-passionate lifestyle. Next Monday, I'm talking about writing non-fiction and bringing it alive with personal stories with Natalie Sisson, who's from New Zealand, so you get a lovely accent. So, happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes, available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.